Sorry, I'm like, oh, I think we have to go. I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're about to start another one. We're just taking it Hello everyone and welcome to the 2015 Seattle Design Festival. The festival is in its fifth year. It's produced by Design and Public and AIA Seattle. And we're about halfway through now. There are over 100 events and installations over a couple of weeks. And so there's lots more coming next week. If you haven't picked up a schedule, please do so before you leave. Um, the festival is made possible by support of our generous sponsors, many of whom have been with us since the beginning, and we couldn't do it without them. I wanted to particularly acknowledge our gold sponsors, Urban Visions, Teague, Intentional Futures, DLR Group, LMN, and the National Endowment for the Arts, and we couldn't do it without them and all of our other generous sponsors. And actually, one of the sponsors that's been with us from the beginning is Artifacts. I'm particularly thrilled to introduce our next speaker, Masuma Henry. She is the executive director of Artifact, a product design and technology firm. She's also on the board of Design and Public. And this year's theme was very personally uh, of interest and motivating to her. So I'm really excited to hear her speak today. Please join me in welcoming Masuma Henry. Thank you, Lisa, for that kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming. It's very appropriate that we're in the Seattle um, Public Library today, given that it's a theme of equity and what more of an equitable building than a public space like a library. 
So thank you to the Seattle Public Library for having us here today as well. The, the subject for the lecture um, that I'm going to be talking about today is called Design for Equity, Design for Agency, Action, and Movements. But before we go into it, I want to, I want to caveat the talk um, with the goal of making this more of a presentation. We have enough of a group of people to make this like an active and live conversation. There's a lot of topics right now going on in Seattle that are um, up for good conversation about how to design better movements, better action, and better agency for people in inequitable situations. So please interrupt me while I'm speaking, and I'm going to ask a lot of questions of you as well. So a little bit about Artifact, the company I come from. So we are a human-centered design um, company in Seattle. We work on technology design, and the lens through which we see the world is called human-centered design. And that is very much a lens of seeing design through the problem individuals have and trying to solve for those problems. Some of the topics and problems that we work on are um, you know, challenges like when people are riding in public settings on bicycles, how do you keep them safe? One of the products we designed for that is a backpack that shows commuters behind the biker through their backpack, um, their turn signals, for example, in low light settings. We also work on maternal health and infections. This photo is a woman who had just helped deliver a baby in Bangladesh. And we're working on how to help mothers understand that they do have infections and when they need to go seek more formal care outside of the village. And we also work on subjects like how to make technology and wearable devices actually help people with their health. So it's great that we can actually have wearables for fun and entertainment. But what if you could actually have um, wearable technology on your wrist and before a seizure, you could actually gesture on your wrist, understand when your seizure was coming, understand the patterns, and then know to go to a safe place in the future. So these are some of the projects that we work on. And the reason that we decide to take on projects like this at a technology design firm is because we really care about a philosophy called 21st century design. And essentially, it's designed for preferable outcomes, positive outcomes, and social impact. So we know that as designers, when we make you know, a physical thing like a cup, or a space like a library, or even a piece of software like an iPhone app, that by nature of people using it, they're going to change their behavior. And so it's our responsibility to actually change your behavior in the way that we really intended. And we're very lucky right now because design is in what I call a renaissance period. We have become popularized as a profession by these folks. Steve Jobs, of course, of late has really popularized the, the field of design. Beautiful and new disruptive pro uh, products like the Nest have been taking design that was typically for the elite or for a certain segment of society and putting well-designed objects in every people's, in people's homes. Walt Disney has contributed to this, Ikea, um, and even products like the Dyson vacuum cleaner have really made a breakthrough for design as of late. But what comes along with this popularity and renaissance is an obligation as well. We have a seat at the table or a place at the podium and while we're looking at beautiful things and using entertaining devices, this is what is happening in our world today. We have the refugee crisis, we have global warming, we have urbanization, and these are really the world's wickedest problems. The wicked problems that are huge, they're systemic, and they need a bunch of people to work on them, designers included. So the question we've been posing for ourselves at Artifact, and I've been posing for myself in my career, is can we make change to society through design? Who thinks we can? Great, so do I. <laughs> so I'd like to demonstrate an example of where we'd actually had big impact. And that's with vaccination of polio. So this graph shows that in 19... 88, a good portion of the world still had polio um, outbreaks. And in 2014, most of the world actually didn't have any cases anymore. 
And if you actually look at today's data, it's the same case. The only countries that have not eliminated polio are the ones in really remote regions um, where they have war. And the polio vaccinators cannot go out to those really remote regions because of safety and difficulty traversing the land. The reason um, that we've been able to do this is because we put a concerted effort behind it. We decided we, we, had, we decided to do it, we had organizations behind it, and we kind of attacked the problem from both the systemic policy level, we also attacked the problem from an individual level. There are people going out in rural Afghanistan and rural India carrying vaccination backpacks, traveling two to 50 miles a day, and knocking on doors and vaccinating. In, in my family, my father-in-law was born in Iraq, when, when the vaccinators came from the Red Cross to his house, he was two years old. And his mother didn't believe in the vaccination. She was wondering, you know, who are these foreigners that are coming to their house and knocking on doors. So they hid him under the floorboards. And it was his nine-year-old sister, after the vaccinators left, that went and ran after them in, in the streets and called them back because at nine years old, she understood the impact of getting medical treatment like this called them back to the house with no English and showed them the floorboards and they took him out and they vaccinated him. Now he's 74 years old and living a great functioning life, but it could have been a very different story for him. So that individual action of his nine-year-old sister possibly could have saved his life. And that's what I want to focus on a lot of my talk today is how do you make big systemic change for the world's wickedest problems? And I think the way that we can do it as human-centered designers um, and designers in the broadest sense of the world, anyone who actually solves problems is through individuals. So imagine you're an everyday person in an everyday society, you're one person. And as designers, we solve problems for this guy. What's important to note is that individuals, they don't exist in isolation. So whenever you design something, you're designing it for that person, but it's also for the interaction that they're going to have with others as a result of whatever they use that you design. And all those people and the norms that they have, that is what makes culture. So the fact that here in Seattle, we decide to wear ties, some, some of us to work, that's a social norm. The fact that we wear a veil on our wedding day, that's a social norm. And that is a depiction of what we stand for. And that's actually what makes society. So society is comprised of individuals acting together, exhibiting their social norms as an expression of what they believe in and forming a society. So when you think about society this way, the problem doesn't seem so daunting. Solving for big societal problems is where systems designers typically works. Those are policymakers, economists, people who work at the governmental and public policy level typically. And at the individual level is where human-centered designers typically work. And it's both of these that are necessary to have huge transformative impact on the world. Both are necessary to solve the polio problem. It's the vaccinator knocking on the door, getting my father-in-law out of the floorboards, and it's also the regulators and the policymakers in the government who allow the vaccinators to even be there that day and allow that program to exist within their country. And I want to go over another example that I think is particularly transformative, and that's microfinance. Who knows what microfinance and the microfinance movement is? Okay, great. So there's about half of you, so I'll go in, into it in a little bit of detail. So microfinance is basically encouraging income generation or entrepreneurship in the world's poorest people. Mohammed Yunus, who is from Bangladesh and is a Nobel Peace Prize winner, um, is considered to be the father of microfinance, but the microfinance has actually existed in traditional societies for hundreds and hundreds of years. He went out and he did a groundbreaking study, and what he realized was that the poor are, are very economically active. 
if they're dealing with small amounts of money, $2 a day, they're having to make really good decisions about where they spend that money, right? Because their livelihoods or children's livelihoods are at stake. But with the small amounts of money that they have, they are not entrepreneurial because they don't have enough, basically, to start businesses. And there's a ton of barriers that exist with the world's poor, the 3 billion people who live on less than $2 a day to starting their own businesses. Most of them are informal laborers, so they can't save up a good amount of money. They don't have stable income. There are loan sharks that are lending them money to go buy their crops and resell them, charging them interest rates of up to 1,000% per year. There are issues with safety. Where do you, where do you say, put your money if you actually live in a small hut or if you live in a small shack and there's crime in your neighborhood? Um, there's protection against shock. So imagine if you didn't have enough money is that, that next time the rainfalls came, your house would be wiped up and you didn't have enough money to go buy the corrugated sheet you needed to build your wall. Your kids' um, education and your food is a little bit, you know, it's, it's a question, it's a trade-off that you make. There's also susceptibility to corruption. Basically, all of this means that there's never enough to get enough of a pool of money together to go invest, let's say, in a small amount of things to go drive your business, whether that's bamboo strands to make blankets to go sell at the market, or whether that's the local tomatoes to go sell along with your fish to go make a dish to sell at the market. So the idea behind microfinance is let's take the unbankable and reframe the problem of them being unbankable and make them excellent credit risk. The idea is, if you're so poor that small amounts of money mean a lot to you, you're probably gonna be really motivated to pay someone back and make sure you can get another loan and another loan and another loan because you realize the impacts on your life. And it was this foundational belief that led Mohammed Yunus to open up the Grameen Foundation, which is now one of the biggest microfinance institutions in the world and do micro lending all over the world. So this is how it works. So basically there's a person living below the poverty line. It's typically a woman. And she forms a group of people from six to 15 people and they're people in her community. And this group of people are people like her. There are other people in the village. They are women as well. They're basically a support group. The organization will lend them a small amount of money to start a business. And they'll receive mentoring and training to actually go start that business. In six to 12 months or longer periods, they can repay that loan. And then once they repay it, they get to grow their business. And the impacts have been amazing. The World Bank estimates that 500 million people have benefited from microfinance. That's the direct recipients, the people that they've um, supported and the family households. There is a repayment rate that is unparalleled to any other lending type of institution. Many people, if you're familiar with microfinance, say it's because they focus primarily on women. Women are really motivated to repay their loans because where they put their money and they put their focus is back into their families. Some estimates have been that the $100 of lending that you give turn into um, $7,150 of economic impact. And of course, the long-term consequence is when a woman has the ability to make decisions within her family about money, because she holds the purse strings essentially, it empowers them to have more gender parity within the household. So what, I wanna talk about why I think this works. And there's been a lot of analyses on microfinance and why people think it works. And I think it's because um, it's attacking human-centered design at a different level than we've typically looked at it. So typically people look at human-centered design, or sorry, at microfinance, and they think about it as a kind of a service design. So we've designed a service and that service works really well. But I think there are two key parts of what that service has done exceptionally well, and that is my opinion of what I think is essential when you're designing for underserved communities. So one is, this idea of designing for agency. And that is the, the individual belief in the ability to make change or act. 
So imagine that the person that you're designing for in this environment is a woman who's lived in the village the entire, her entire life. She may be about 30 years old. She has three to seven children. She probably got married when she was 15 years old. She may be illiterate. And she has no power in her society or in her household. She's never made an economic decision. She's never made a decision of where to send her kids to school or if she can. And she's never been able to make societal or community-based decisions. It's the men that kind of dominate the village. So how can you actually design something for her? If you design something that's solving a problem that she has, so for example, if you give her money and that was a problem, she lacks money. There's nothing she can do with that money. She has no confidence in her ability to make financial decisions. She has no support. And she lacks a sense of agency or belief in oneself and herself. So that's where I feel like microfinance has had really amazing strides. So what the microfinance movement does is that they make women gather together in the villages and they're people like them. They're, and they work together for the entire course of the loan. And so they're always supported. They also have a trainer that comes from the institution. That trainer is almost always a woman as well. And she goes in and talks to not only the women who are going to get the loan, but their husbands, their mother-in-laws, their religious folks in the village. And they convince them of the ability of the woman to make this decision. They get permission and shared agreement and alignment on the business that they should be starting. And along the way, they actually train in business tasks. So, you know, what is your business plan going to be? What are you going to sell? What price should you buy the goods at? What should you sell it at? And there's a very rigorous program that is designed to give women a sense of agency. The other big design component where I think microfinance has had big strides is that it provides and designs for action. And that's making the ability to act accessible and easy. So here's a picture of rural women in India who have started their microfinance business. And the goods that they bought were um, bamboo sheaths or reeds, and they're basically making you know, handicrafts, placemats and blankets and, and mats, and they're going to resell them. And what's made it really easy for them to act is number one, they're doing it together. People they're familiar with, their family members and their friends. They're doing it in a safe environment of people they already know, but they're also supported by the trainers. And then every step along the way, they're getting training. And so at any point where people typically feel barriers to act and move forward, they're getting support. The microfinance movement does a great job of also thinking about the insecure people, um, situations people are in. So these same women are probably really um, affected by things like drought in the village. And so what they do, rather than being really, really rigid about their repayment mechanism or timeline, is that they allow them to extend time but they offer counseling of what to do if something like that happens. So it's through making these actions very easy and supported that big movements can happen. Microfinance has had huge impact in the world. And it has only really been through what I believe are these two tenants, agency and action, that movements are able to happen. There are other really great examples of this in the world today. I think change.org, are you familiar with change.org? It's a website that allows you to, any individual person to start a petition in pretty much five clicks on the internet. And it, I actually started one recently for my first time a few weeks ago. It took me about 10 minutes. And in one day I was able to garner support from more than 100 people. And from there, it helps you along the way to get more and more petitions and helps you figure out who are the right people to send it to in government to make change. So systems like this are really embodying these two kind of points of agency and action through the design of their systems. So that is what I believe the new human-centered design is. It's the design for transformative impact. It's a design for movements and it's thinking about agency and action within the design process. Do you have any questions?
What I'd love to do today is have a discussion. Again, there's a small enough group of us that I think it would be great to have a discussion about some of the things that are happening in Seattle today. There are a bunch of hot topics here. Urbanization, micro apartments, teacher strike. I'm sure there are many more. <clears throat> And I'd love to hear from you, what are movements that we, you think we need to design for in Seattle? Yes? Well, can I just go back to an example of the kind of things we were talking about? I went to a UN NGO conference on uh, um, housing issues in Istanbul uh, oh, about 20 years ago. And I will never forget a group of Maasai women in the uh, uh, delegation from their country who would have to get back to the and they said, what are the problems that we women have, have to deal with in our lives? One was that they had to walk tremendous long distances to the firewood uh, and the same uh, for the water. And they designed a little uh, Hard-fired ceramic stone mm -hmm. uh, in which you could get more heat with less firewood for cooking. You know, we've all arranged three or four stones to try to balance the cooking problem. It's very inefficient. They designed an efficient uh, uh, stone. Uh, they found the components of right hand clay, they manufactured it, uh, and they sold it. And the other um, the third that the one comes to mind uh, was a way of collecting uh, water off the roof uh, of the essentially land impact parts. Uh, oh, they made a huge clay pot in which they could uh, collect it. And the degree to which this changed their lives from very minimal investment uh, in materials uh, uh, was really inspiring. Yeah, that, that's a great example of where design can have huge impact. And I've had a similar experience too, where thinking about you know these really, really small changes to an environment or a process um, within some of the research that we've done has had such huge impact. The, um, when I was in Bangladesh recently, when we were working on a maternal infections project, a, a similar example is the women that are um, giving helping people have babies there are they tend to be traditional birth attendants so they're not trained for example or they have training for minimal amounts of times maybe two hours and a lot of times where they're actually helping to birth is inside um you know a hut or a small house and there's no electricity so it's dark and so you can imagine it's really hard to actually help someone deliver a baby when it's so dark there are many things that are going on you can't see if they're, the woman is bleeding you can't see basically, um, you know, if there's duress going on with the baby. And one of the most amazing kind of design um, interventions, I would call it, that was there, that a um, governmental organization had dis disseminated was a way scale. Because one of the big problems in Bangladesh is um, babies die from being underweight, severely underweight. So there was a, a way scale that was hanging outside of the birthing hut and you could put the baby on it and it was binary. There was only two modes. It was either like um, red or green. So red was the baby's underweight, you need to do something about it. And green was, it's fine. And the ability for the traditional birth attendant to quickly make a decision and see this binary action of like basically make a decision or don't worry about it, had huge implications on whether the baby has actually had care got formal care and also had huge implications on their birthing um, survival rates. And this was in one village that I visited. I'm sure there were several other, but it's it's really, the example you brought up is great because it is really the, these kind of small interventions that can have really big impact. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. uh, Right. 
do you think that there is um when it comes to the the issue of not people not being connected to each other do you think that there is um any kind of intervention or any individuals that we can um, work with in order to help this problem the buy nothing project Mm -hmm. That is great. I'm going to repeat some of that for the people that might have not heard in the back. And I also advocate for Buy Nothing because I'm a big fan and member of Buy Nothing as well. So it's a Facebook group that I think is a wonderful example of how we can attack the problem of connectedness or neighborhood um, friendliness. And it's a Facebook group where you, you belong to it based on the location you live in. And you basically share your goods. You shared your banana bread because you didn't want to eat it all yourself. I've actually shared things that I think I may not want to take to Goodwill. They're still really kind of like functional and usable and it's it'd be easy to give it away quickly and meet our neighbors. I met someone, posted on there and someone called me in four minutes and came to pick it up. And it was someone I had never met before but lived across the street. So it's a really great way of kind of demonstrating that as well. It's like quick, it's easy to act and the movement is actually building community. It's a great example. It's connected to the previous speakers. With it. I hope you know, the, the new waterfront improvements will bring back some other social aspect of, of, of like a village, let's mm -hmm. say, like sit down places because that interaction is, is great. I think uh, we kind of walk away from the personal contact, personal mm -hmm. level of. of Knowing each other, we were we were probably kind of you know I, I live in several, several places in the world, and I see the road. I think it's actually getting worse in the sense that people come here to work to that town, they go go out, they come on the value we even there I live in the places really missing that social aspect, right. which will solve a lot of problems without a lot of design. Mm -hmm. Providing place, uh, safe place, public space where uh, those interactions can take place. And right. then the community will take care of that, that little fine detail. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be already uh, detailed. But I hope there will be some really clever effect uh, that will be uh, Right. Right. Yeah, I think the this theme of connectedness is something that's been rapidly happening because of the fact that Seattle has been growing so much as a community. And I agree that I since I've moved to Seattle, which has been now quite some time, it does feel like it's a little bit harder to connect. Um, I know the waterfront is trying to actually mitigate, a, you know, against this kind of just consumerism feel, and they're trying to build public spaces, um, which I'm hoping are, are going to help with that as well. You had a comment. Yeah, jumping off that, um, as far as creating public spaces, 
where we can conduct some can have conversations. Yesterday was um, International and Seattle Parking Day, so probably went to the part of the festival. And um, so for those of you who don't know, like parking spots are sort of transformed into small parks or a wide variety of activities and lounges. And my coworkers and I like actually took a real lunch break. And <laughs> And by walking around downtown and kind of square to check out all the different parking spots. And it was really fun. And it was, I felt like it was very refreshing because you went into it with an expectation for conversation. Like people wanted to explain what they were doing in their space or what their organization was up to. And everyone was just in a happy mood. It was like this fun, random thing happening. Um, so, ways to create more of that impact. And I'm not just wanting to be here. Yeah, that's great. Parking day is actually quite an international phenomenon too, which I just found out about. Did anyone else see any of the parking day kind of lots all over the city? I think one of my favorite ones was the bubble, um, the bubble parking lot. That was pretty cool. Are there other things that are happening in Seattle right now where you feel like there's actually the opportunity for us as individuals to make change and kind of create a sense of community? I'd say housing for lower and families. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the, you know, the individuals that could be impacted or given a sense of agency in, in that example? I mean, I think that's a problem that needs to be solved on both levels. Mm -hmm. I think the individual might be a, a lower income or middle income person for their whole family. I think that the systemic change on a number of levels, um, yeah. whether it's through micro units or um, you know, some of the creative solutions to creating space for people who are right. Yeah, I think that that's a great example. I think micro micro units and and affordable housing is, of course, a big topic of mayor election here. And one of the things, one of the opportunities for I think um, individual action in that example is what I'm seeing with a lot of the gatherings that are happening. Um, they're a little bit formal in the settings. They're the town halls that are happening in the communities. And so in, in our neighborhood, in kind of the Greenwood neighborhood, um, churches and community centers are basically giving public space to have the forum and building in, um, inviting the builders and government officials to come talk about the implications to the neighborhood. A lot of people are showing up because they're worried about parking, which makes a lot of sense, you know, because the micro units don't come with parking spaces. But it's the very fact that um, the town halls or the public conversations are happening in, in your neighborhood that have made them really easy to access. And also the fact that they're putting up public flyers everywhere gives you as an individual a sense of agency like, oh, I can actually go make a difference. There's going to be someone there that is actually listening to me. So I know because of some of the work that we do at Design in Public, I've been exposed to um, the intentionality behind some of that advocacy for regular citizens to go to those meetings and advocate either against microhousing or to make tweaks to it. And I think that has actually been really good. I think we still have a long way to go, um, but they're doing a pretty good job, I think, in Seattle, at least trying to involve community members in the part, um, conversation. Has anyone gone to one of those town halls or community events about microhousing? They're they're pretty packed, aren't they? <laughs> I also want to spend some time thinking about um, in our Seattle neighborhood. Who are the individuals that you think need to have a better sense of agency, and what are things that we can do? to help the underserved get a sense of agency, a sense of belief that they have the ability to act. So we talked about just kind of advocacy, having posters, bringing conversations to the neighborhood, education and training. Gather and we ask questions about what 
That's great. Yeah, that's a great example. I'll repeat it um, for everyone on Tuesday as part of the Seattle Design Festival. Um, there's going to be a discussion where home, homeless people are actually asked what they would like and be involved in a discussion on what should be basically designed for them. And that, I think that's a really great example of um, what I've called participatory design. A lot of other people have names for it, like particip uh, participatory action research. But it's basically getting the people who are underserved involved in the conversation when we're designing for them. So a good example of that is the city of Seattle is planning um, for what Seattle looks like in the year 2030. And a big part of that is the design of the waterfront and what will be around that neighborhood. And one of our board members went to one of those meetings and realized that there were no African Americans in that conversation at all. And so through a series of kind of advocacy connections we had, we made sure that that conversation was happening and a committee was formed called Black Seattle 2030. Now, that, I think that's a really interesting case study because it, it shows that you know, no one did that purposefully. I don't believe that people did that purposefully. It's just that the people who happened to work on the board weren't thinking about the world from that lens or from that perspective. And so I think it's really important for us to be thinking about who do we involve in our conversations? Are the people involved in conversations made about decision making, the people who you're actually serving? Or are they the people who are decision makers? And a lot of times decision makers are very different from the people you're actually serving. And why don't those people who are serving have a place um, on the decision-making committee? And that is a one big way of providing agency is to allow people who are underserved, whether it's economically by not being represented, um, by being marginalized in their history, or by any other reason involving them in the conversation. So one of the things I like about, actually about the Seattle Design Festival is the reason that the public library was picked is specifically because it's a place of community, there's good transport, it allows kind of all walks, it's built to allow all walks of life to gather here and have a safe place. And so that was very intentional to make sure conversation was happening, not in the small design bubble that we typically live in, but with the broader community. Yeah. Yeah. Communication and visual communication to invite people to come in. That's great. Yeah. Back there. Also, create How do we also create our Oh, I mean, that don't speak English. Great point. Uh, but I noticed that there are no flyers in other, any other languages, if I can recall. Mm. And also, being here, if there were some of that did not speak English, how could they benefit from uh, the information that people would see? So, how do we create edges in different communities to where English is not the primary language? That is a fantastic point. That is, yeah, that is a really fantastic point. And you're right in that Seattle is, Seattle especially is growing when it comes to a lot of technology workers, as we all know. We hear about the news, but actually one of the biggest growing populations in Seattle are actually immigrants and particular immigrant groups. And so we actually do have the ability to, to focus on where are those growth areas, what are kind of the biggest populations, and how do we provide conversation between English speakers and non-English speakers. Sort of along the same lines as communities um, that are forming um, that may not be indigenous in the United States. Uh, I think senior aging population, awareness mm -hmm. of, of social health and wellness services. Um, it's like it's um, it's difficult to navigate that landscape. Um, if you are if you're a care partner or if you're a are someone who is in those situations. Right. So, um, I think that's the agency that's just taking that. Mm -hmm. 
That is a really great point about seniors as well. Do you know of any um, kind of programs that currently exist within Seattle or that Seattle's promoting to help seniors navigate like health um, systems? I do, and it's more of a personal experience since my wife works um, in healthcare as a therapist and uh, she volunteers with Seattle Seniors Network. And there's a lot of Right. Yeah, that is a really great point. You talked about the um, recent increase in population and the fact that a lot of immigrants are part of that. I was um, talking with the King and Demographer mm -hmm. recently, and he has some fascinating slides that show that 95% of the recent population net increase to King County is either making over $125,000 a year or under $35,000. Wow. So there's no middle in there at all. And the reason I'm bringing that up is I love your slide that shows the jobs and all those things. But what that immediately made me think of is kind of the culture changes that come about and some of the exclusionary effects of right. those culture changes and the smartphone. This is when I like, the new iPhone, which is over six hundred dollars, right? Um, just came out and it's broken all records for advanced sales. Um, but and sixty more than sixty percent of people in poverty have do not have a landline; they right. only have cell phones. Um, and so sometimes they spend money on their cell phones, and their kids, you know, they have trouble paying rent. Have trouble paying um, for food and stuff, in part because it's so important these mm -hmm. days that you have that cell phone. And right. it seems to be a smartphone. And so I'm wondering if designers can make, try to deal with that inequity. I mean, that is hugely expensive to yeah. buy the device and then to keep paying the monthly um, price for it. And you know, designers who are trying to do it, so it's like to design correctly and right. have a great shot. That, that is a great question. I will answer that, but I'm going to repeat the question first. So it started off with kind of this interesting statistic about how the growth in Seattle is actually happening in two clear parts income-wise. One is over 125, so 95% of the growth in Seattle is happening with an income bracket that's over 20, 125,000 a year and under, under 35,000 a year. So that is huge disparity and unfortunately mimicking what is happening with a lot of income disparity trends in, in a lot of urban cities in the states. And your question is about technology designers in particular, you know, who is taking that the cost of smartphones, which are become so necessary in life, into account? Um, so I can, I can answer that kind of the, um, I'll tell you what my experience has been as a technology designer, because I've always worked in technology. And one of the struggles that I've had in my career is that the, um, because I care about equity and I always have, sometimes it feels like there's a competing tension in technology that a lot of technology companies are focused on selling goods, right? It makes sense, they're for-profit companies. And the way you sell goods often in technology is people say they want to do technology for education or technology to um, do better for themselves in many other ways. But I know from working in technology that the reason people buy technology is because there's cool features. And they also, when they actually start using it, most people tend to do media and entertainment on their technology devices, even when they self-report that they were they plan to do education or kind of life things, life and betterment things on it. So I think the question for us has been of late, besides the question of how do you get the price down, the question is what do we do that is actually a preferable outcome? and combining people's inherent interest in technology. So yesterday in our design studio, we were talking about edu designing education technology. And we, po we first posed our design question as, how do you get kids to play outside more using their interest in technology? And one of the women in the studio said, I'm not sure that should be the goal. I actually don't want them to use the technology outside. 
I want them to play outside more, but I don't want their phone to go with them. I just love them to like put their phone away. And so we started thinking, well, wouldn't it be a really interesting design question to say, how can we stop having our kids use technology and go outside and play more? And that's a tension that exists in technology design, right? Because that's not typically the end that you're working towards. The typically the end that you're working towards is how do you sell more services or um, sell more things? And when clients come to you, that's the brief that they come to you and give, right? We want to make the next iPhone and we want to basically conquer, be number one in America or conquer this demographic. So at Artifact, we have a lot of really good discussion and debate about how do you reframe the problem for clients. And one of the ways that we've been successfully doing that is because we have this philosophy that we've called 21st century design, and it gives us a framework to at least reframe the problem. And the framework allows us to go through and say, okay, well, what, why do you want to sell technology? What is your ultimate outcome? Do you care about making meaning in people's life? Do you understand that if you do that, it's attached to your brand and that's actually better for you? There's a win win in all of this. So that's how we've been tackling it tackling it is to try to reframe the problem with our clients very, very, from the very, very beginning. And I have to say that I've been pretty pleasantly surprised with even really large technical technology corporations, for example, like Google, um, who might come to us with the idea of making something, but are really open to changing it to think about making a meaningful experience and then working backwards from there to design the thing. I know that was a long answer. I don't think there is an easy one, an easy answer to your question, so I thought I'd just recount a personal experience. Go ahead. Uh, going off this, this is an example that I kind of find open, is that I think the whole buying and selling every year is a huge waste, and I know a lot of my friends try as long as they can to not buy the phone until you know, the breaks and whatnot. Um, but we'll be working on this whole project tomorrow, mm -hmm. where it's the uh, it's a great project. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll repeat it for everyone that it's Google Aura, and it's basically mod a modular cell phone where you can change out the parts of the cell phone, um, and you don't have to actually change out your new ce your cell phone every single year. So the components that are still good, you keep them, and it allows you to basically um, be more sustain sustainable and more friendly to the environment, but then also just not to get into like the perpetual consumption habits of technology. Any other examples that where you think people, technology providers, are actually doing a good job? Uber. Hmm? Uber. Uber. What do you think is good about Uber? I think Uber is Right. Yeah. 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 Those are great examples. I think the um, I categorize those as being part of like the sharing economy. So this idea of like you have a car sitting in your garage, why don't you drive it and give other people a ride? Or you have an extra bedroom, why don't you allow people to couch surf? You have an extra room or an extra vacation home. What about Airbnb? And I've seen a lot of models like that emerging. Portland has a really great resource where people donate their tools to a tool library. Like, you know, the, the tools that you use once in your life to like repaint your bedroom or do, you know, redo your fence. And basically people go in and they check them in and they check them out. And so you don't actually have to go buy them every single time. Because really how many of us have a power drill that no one ever uses? So for once. You do have it here, what's it, what's it called? The Finney Public Neighborhood Association. Oh, that's great to know. Okay. 
Okay, so Seattle. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. I did see, I didn't know about any of these. That's awesome. Okay. I've also seen a lot of use and reuse of um, books that are happening, kind of micro libraries that are happening where people will put out something that looks like a birdhouse, but is actually like a little library exchange and you can just walk by on the street, grab a book, leave one there if you want. And I think that's a really great way to do this sharing economy as well. You had a comment up here. Oh, okay. um, I just wanted to comment on all this. I, I think um, the sharing economy is fantastic. It's a great sustainable model. But I also think it's important for people to own certain aspects of production or distribution or means. Um, much like in the software industry, it's not for any software, the software is a service. I think you can only outsource these things so much before. Um, I actually want to produce my own electricity and then redistribute that. Hmm. I actually want to take control of my data and redistribute that and monetize that. Right. So how can we how can we design systems that empower people and decentralize and flatten the mechanisms that are creating this inequalities, whether it's transportation or housing mm -hmm. or, or finance? Um, so I, I think really as designers, that's that's the challenge. Pick any one of those. If right. you can disrupt that, and you can, you know, you know, help bring people exponentially, you can you know, create an almost change the world. Right. So, um, for instance, in Seattle, that can be quality. Um, that's a big deal, and, and that's systemic everywhere. Right. right. So if if we can design empowering systems for communities to self-employed, whether that's co-ops, whether that's, I mean, it doesn't have to be women in India, it's people here mm -hmm. in Seattle who need For sure. services and, and techniques and tools to be able to get out of the you know, low-income bus, yeah. or at least have a pathway to um, a livable, sustainable future. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, I think it's just really the systems and how can we then leverage Technology mm -hmm. and the network effect to create transformative exponential change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great point. And I do think that's that's our big challenge, especially with technology, right? Is I think technology traditionally has been in the form of entertaining and and but taking kind of data from people as well. And now it's in this amazing place where technology is able to use data. Everyone's calling it the big data movement. But where is the responsibility? in using that data? And why is it actually fair or equitable that I get to take your data and monetize it? You should own it, yes. right? You should provide it to me for a service. And I think there are a bunch of companies that are looking at that. At least, I don't think there are very many companies that I've heard of, um, please chime in, are thinking about actually monetizing the data provider, the person, but at least they're thinking about how to um, make it very secure and aggregated so that you don't get identified. So dealing with more privacy and security concerns. Go ahead. There actually is an organization called Open Seattle that I just recently, I'm not a founder at all, but um, it's, they're part of the Code for America yeah. mm -hmm. the game. Yeah. I actually just got a grant to work with them. I put out a community that's and we just got the Civic Tech Collaborative Grant, uh, and we are working with other cities to try to sort of figure out what the data and um, tech needs are for low income people and then address those needs. I mean, that's a huge task, and I don't you know, I don't know exactly how we're going to do it, but um, I was really impressed with these things because. They've got, they're very concerned about privacy, mm -hmm. and they've got technology and skills that most of us don't have. So I have high hopes for, you know, what they might do in the future. Okay. You probably love this Open Seattle. Open Seattle. Yeah, they've got meetups all the time. Great. That's great. I'll take two more questions or comments because I think we're at time. Go ahead. I was just commenting on the whole, I think in the next like, year or so, 
I was and I just rolled up any features that may add blocking as possible. Right. And content providers have essentially declared more on that by rolling up their own technology that sees and add blockers and blocks actual content because you have blockers. Hmm. <laughs> so I'm very curious to see how it's going to roll out in terms of it's like these apps will pop and you know, apps come. Right. And that the, uh, with like TV shows like just the robot coming out about how Data is like the whole line and it's what you're providing for. Yeah. That's kind of spreading. Probably not from the, um, or how it's spreading from the community. It's not in a different world. Right. So that, that yeah, there's definitely there's a shift happening, I feel like, right now, too, from um, regular citizens becoming more concerned about their, like, kind of their data usage, even though we've actually been using their data for a really long time. Yeah. But, but actually, regular citizens are becoming aware of the issues, and I think that's actually going to really help to raise a conversation about what is fair and what is equitable. There was someone in the back who had their hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, and I would, it's a great point. So the question was, you know, that with the tool libraries that we were talking about that are part of the sharing economy, we're placing them in neighborhoods where there are already people who have tools or can afford tools. Should we be thinking about them in other neighborhoods where people can't access and afford tools? And I would say, in addition, like the, the design question I would ask is how do you give those folks a sense of agency that they can even go like imagine if you don't have identification, you can't sign up for a library card or identification, I don't think. I'm not sure. Can you? We're working on it. That's great. It's awesome that we're working on it. And what if you don't know English? There's a big barrier to even getting to know about it, but then feeling confident enough to go and sign up for a registration card. And then on top of that, it's how do I use this thing, which we all have barriers to with power tools, especially me. And so there are all these steps in the, in the process that we need to think about agency along the way at every single point. And, and in closing, since we are over time, um, I would say that that is like the one point I would love for everyone to think about today during this great conversation we had within our community is we've typically been solving problems that people have in the world. And in order to solve for the underserved and in order to solve for big change and big movements, we really need to be thinking about giving people a sense of agency and allowing them to act. And it's through those two things that it will allow for movements. Thank you very much for having a great conversation.